Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining today's Dream Wakers Daily Conversation. Today, we're talking with Dr. Matthew Costello. Dr. Costello serves as a senior historian at the White House Historical Association, as well as vice president of the David M. Rubenstein National Center for White House History, and as a lecturer at American University. He published his first book in 2019 on the memory of George Washington and is currently at work on a second project that explores the impact of Theodore Roosevelt and his family on the White House. His dream is to bring his platform for history to more people, sorry, his passion for history to more people, especially younger ones, so they can learn its importance in understanding the world around us. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Dr. Costello. We're excited to talk with you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to to showing you a little bit more sort of behind the scenes history of the White House. And, uh, you know, because everybody is trapped indoors, why not take a look at some of the fun outdoor spaces uh, the White House grounds has to offer? Absolutely. I love that idea. Um, and I will just let you take it away. I know you've prepared a great presentation for us and I'm ready for my tour of the White House. Great. Uh, so the, this first image that we're looking at, this is actually the south view of the White House. Uh, so if you were standing on, on the south grounds, um, and this is what you can see from right around the National Mall, uh, what the White House uh, looks like. But the White House certainly looked very different uh, when we back up uh, over 200 years ago. In 1791, it was President George Washington who picked the site for the president's house to be built. And uh, even though he wouldn't live there, Washington played a major role in deciding who would design it, who would build it, where it would be placed, what materials it would be made of. But it was his successors who would decide how the grounds and the outdoor space would be used for the president and the first families. Uh, this is actually an architectural rendering uh, that we credit to Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. Jefferson uh, was uh, an architect. Uh, he was very interested in the use of outdoor spaces and design, and as you can tell, uh, certainly put quite a bit of thought uh, into the President's Park at that time. Now, Jefferson thought that the north side of the White House should become the formal entrance, and that that space on the other side should be more of a public park, uh, what is today Lafayette Square. On the south side, he saw that more as the President's backyard. In fact, you can see uh, that he has designed what looks like sort of a long uh, green uh, lawn just south of the White House uh, at the bottom of the screen. You also have some natural woods. You have a president's garden. Uh, and you would have had a special entrance off to the southeast corner uh, where the president would have come in if he say they were coming down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol. Um, so you have this design that Jefferson imposes. If you look also around what's enclosing the White House, that's actually the first, uh, the first fence. Uh, so Jefferson had a wooden fence installed early in his presidency. And then later he had a stone wall built uh, called a ha, -ha wall. And uh, these were really popular in Europe. Uh, and it was a way to actually keep uh, livestock uh, from, from climbing onto your property. So the whole idea behind a ha, -ha wall was that essentially having a stone wall built into the side of a hill uh, so that animals wouldn't be able to keep walking onto your onto your lawn, uh, eating your flowers or your plants, and and then you wouldn't have a fence obstructing your view. Uh, so if you keep in mind where the White House is today, uh, if you're looking south, uh, you would see the National Mall. In Jefferson's time, uh, there was actually a, a small creek called the Tiber Creek that ran right along where Constitution Avenue is today. So you would have had this very uh, panoramic sweeping view of the of the Washington DC landscape, the Potomac River, uh, and then down the river you would have been able to see Alexandria, Virginia. So Jefferson really saw the south side as being the private grounds for the president and the north side being more the public grounds for the people. Interesting. Any idea why it's called a ha ha wall? Uh, I don't know. I don't find them very funny. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure there is probably a good reason. I'm just not aware of it. Yeah. Um, so this is actually, you can see part of the ha, ha wall here. You can see that's part of the stone wall on the south side. You can see part of the Tiber Creek at the far edge of the screen. Uh, the United States Capitol building is in the background. Uh, so this is supposed to be around circa 1827. Uh, so you can see Washington, D.C. still not very developed as a city. Of course, the president's house really stands out because it's this massive uh, home made of 
sandstone. Uh, and all the other buildings in D.C. at that time are either probably made of wood or brick, uh, aside from the Capitol building uh, and then some of the earliest iterations of the Treasury and the Executive Office buildings. Now, this little enclosure on the left side, that was actually a nursery started by John Quincy Adams. Uh, most people don't know this, but John Quincy Adams, even though he, he was he was sort of a bookworm of sorts, uh, you know, he studied everything and anything he could get his hands on. He was fluent in multiple languages. Uh, but he, since he was always serving in diplomatic posts, he never really had time to put down roots. Uh, apologize for the pun. Uh, he was actually really interested in gardening, but he, he never really had the time. And when he became president, that's when he actually started to devote more time uh, than just studying plants and memorizing their Latin names, he actually wanted to uh, plant saplings. And uh, him and his White House gardener planted over 700 different types of trees on the White House grounds. My goodness. So you can see part of you can see part of Jefferson's wall there. Uh, over time, more and more of the wall will disappear. Now I include this image about John Quincy Adams and his elm tree because. Uh, for, for quite a while, it was the oldest tree uh, associated with the president on the White House grounds. Unfortunately, in 1991, uh, it succumbed to disease and the National Park Service had to cut it down. But the good news is that because the National Park Service oversees the White House grounds and maintains it, they also run uh, greenhouses where they create seedlings and saplings and small trees uh, who are descended from trees planted by presidents. Uh, so you can actually replace the John Quincy Adams elm with, uh, with one of the descendants uh, that was grown uh, from one of the seedlings of that tree. Uh, so the, the shot on the, uh, on the right is the new tree. And I'm sorry, the shot on the right is the old tree, the old John Quincy Adams elm that died in 1991. And the shot of the tree on the left is the tree that was planted by Barbara Bush uh, to replace that tree. Very cool. I had no idea that that was even a possibility. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's not just people that have descendants. Uh, you know, trees have descendants, plants have descendants. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that, you know, based on the, it, it, they were able to date it, they knew it was John Quincy Adams Elms because they counted the tree rings. Mm. Uh, and that put it right around 1826 when it was planted which coincides with what we knew that he was, he was doing an extensive tree planting program at the White House. Very cool. So this is a closer view. Now we're, we're a little bit closer on the South Lawn. So, uh, you know, if we were to attend a state arrival ceremony, uh, you know, this is about where people would be standing to, to, to witness all the pomp and circumstance. Uh, but this is also a better close-up view because you can see these uh, incredible magnolia trees. On, on either side of the White House. Uh, and the one to the left uh, is famously attributed to uh, Andrew Jackson. So uh, the legend behind the tree is that uh, Andrew Jackson brought uh, either a magnolia tree or, or seeds from a tree at his plantation, the Hermitage in Tennessee, with him to Washington, D.C. His wife, Rachel, had died uh, in December so she actually didn't come. He, he came to Washington as a widower and that he planted this tree in her memory and, and that it would grow right outside his window. And, and that way she would always be present with him uh, while he was in uh, the president's house. It's a great story. Yeah. However, um, you know, th there is evidence that suggests that this might have been one of those things where the tree, because it was a magnolia tree, was attributed to Jackson later. Uh, this is actually the earliest uh, daguerreotype photograph of the White House. This was taken in early 1846 during the James K. Polk administration. And if you're looking, this is the south side of the White House. Uh, keep in mind, daguerreotypes are, are mirror images, so you would have to flip it. Uh, but if you're looking off to the side, uh, you're not seeing a, a Jackson Magnolia planted quite yet. Uh, when we jump ahead a little bit more, uh, this is 1862 during the Civil War. Again, we have a south view of the White House. Uh, now it looks like perhaps there is a Jackson Magnolia right about uh, where that tree stands today. So that's 1862. I also like this photograph because you have uh, you have members of the K Company who are were camping out 
uh, on the grounds during the Civil War. And you can see this is actually part of Jefferson's ha-ha wall uh, that they're standing on. Uh, so again, uh, when you look at these images, you can kind of piece together different histories, different moments in White House history uh, to tell a larger story about how these grounds evolved and changed over time. But probably the most famous event associated with the outdoor spaces of the White House is the Easter egg roll. Uh, now, the story behind its beginning uh, can be a little bit murky. So uh, in the 1870s, citizens of Washington, D.C., uh, especially children, really enjoyed uh, egg rolling uh, on some of the sweeping rolling hills uh, throughout the city. Washington, D.C. is a pretty hilly place. Uh, but they had primarily uh, gravitated towards Capitol Hill. And after 1876, uh, Congress had actually just appropriated a lot of money to repair the grounds, and, uh, and then the egg rollers really chewed them up. So they decided to pass a law prohibiting public use of the grounds. This was really to deter people from doing things like egg rolling. In 1877, uh, it was actually the day was rained out, so there was no confrontation or anything like that. But then in 1878, President Rutherford B. Hayes decided to open the White House grounds to the public so that people could do their egg rolling at the people's house. Uh, and this is one of the earliest photographs of, uh, of an egg roll taking place uh, in the late 19th century. Interesting. And I bet you've never been part of an egg roll. What does that part entail? Uh, so over time, it, it's really evolved. They've added more games to it, more more festivities. But back then, it was more, um, you know, really children actually like pushing eggs uh, with spoons or utensils down hills. It was sort of like a race. Okay. And, uh, and later, they would add things like the egg races, egg dying, egg hunts, uh, pretty much anything you can imagine with eggs. Uh, <laughs> it was... And then eventually they realized, you know, it's probably not a good idea to use real eggs. Um, in fact, there, there's newspaper accounts where they talk about you can smell that they had the egg roll, <laughs> um, you know, days after the event. Uh, but then as we get into the 20th century, you know, there's issues with things like food conservation. You know, is this a good use of, of eggs during World War I or World War II? Uh, and then also there's the security issue. You know, can you have this many people on the White House grounds in a time of war or, or crisis. Mm -hmm. Here's a later, this is right before the turn of the 20th century. You can see there the Jackson Magnolia in the background. It's a little bit taller. Uh, it looks like it's, it's up, to the, up to the second level of the White House. Um, and, and here we see a little girl uh, with uh, a young boy at the egg roll. And uh, that's, I think it's about 1898. Uh, so the egg roll is becoming more and more of an annual thing. Now it's drawing more and more people. This is during the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Again, you can see the Jackson Magnolia getting a little bit bigger, a little bit taller. Uh, probably one of the, the, well, there were a couple of celebrities in the early days that made appearances. The first one was during uh, Warren G. Harding's administration. He had a famous uh, Airedale, Airedale Terrier named Laddie Boy. And uh, Laddie Boy actually presided over one of the egg rolls, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, the other famous pet was this one, Rebecca Raccoon. Uh, she was actually given to the Coolidge family in 1926 uh, by a supporter from Mississippi who actually suggested that she would be a great accompaniment to their Thanksgiving dinner. Oh. And the Coolidges decided not to eat Rebecca. They named her, and she became one of the most beloved White House pets. Uh, in the history of the White House. I had no idea that a raccoon was a pet in the history of the White House. <laughs> yep, and you can see in this picture, uh, she actually has Rebecca at the egg roll, and uh, she has Rebecca on a chain, a little leash. So, uh, and I think she's wearing a bow around her neck too. So uh, Rebecca was very friendly, uh, and she actually had a little house on the White House grounds just south of the, uh, of the West Wing. So President Coolidge could go visit her anytime he wanted. <laughs> so, uh, and that kind of, that, it's a good, uh, it's a good pivot point uh, to, you know, go back to what Jefferson thought that really the South grounds are supposed to be for the private use of the first family. Yeah, there, there are times and occasions when you open the grounds up and you let the public 
uh, in to see things, observe things. Uh, but that this is primarily supposed to be like the, the green space, the backyard for the first families. Mm -hmm. And starting with President Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, he is the individual we've always, uh, you know, linked back to this idea of ceremonial tree planting. Uh, you know, people have probably seen in the news or on TV before when presidents or first ladies plant a tree at the White House. Usually uh, they're in the presence of maybe like a visiting dignitary or a head of state or it's to mark some important occasion or commemoration. Uh, and they, this actually goes back to Rutherford B. Hayes in the 1870s, the same person who opened up the grounds for the egg roll. Uh, but over time, you know, those trees have uh, succumbed to disease. They've had to be replaced. And as of right now, uh, I just wanted to share this, the, the oldest tree on the grounds uh, with a known connection uh, and planted uh, by a first lady is Frances Folsom Cleveland. She planted this wonderful Japanese maple tree uh, near the south driveway. And in fact, you can see kind of in the background, there's a smaller one. That one was planted by First Lady Rosalind Carter uh, to match Frances Folsom Cleveland's. Uh, and that was, that was planted in 1893. So as of right now, that is the oldest tree on the grounds with a well-documented connection to a president or first lady. Interesting. Does every first lady or president, have they all planted at least one tree? Yeah, I think pretty much everybody, at least every administration has has planted at least one tree. Some plant more than others. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's also uh, sometimes it's one of those things where, um, you know, maybe a, a tree dies and they decide to plant, uh, you know, uh, a, a sapling from that tree. Uh, is planted by a new administration. So then it's kind of like you're representing two administrations, right? It's right. Uh, it's descended from John Quincy Adams, but it's planted by Barbara Bush. Right. Uh, so you can sort of double dip. Uh, is what <laughs> Interesting. Now, oh, in the 1930s, that's when the National Park Service will take over uh, really the oversight of the grounds. Uh, so you have to imagine, you know, since John Adams moved in in 1800 up until the 1930s, that was about 130, 135 years where there really wasn't a designated government agency or unit tasked with their primary focus was the maintenance of the grounds. So uh, as you can imagine, the grounds were much more rustic, uh, much more natural. Um, and, and beginning in the 1930s uh, with Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, he, he really thought that the, the president's house should have, uh, you know, an out, outdoor spaces that reflect the grandeur and uh, the majesty and the power of the office that, you know, you can't have visiting dignitaries and, uh, and politicians and even Americans coming to visit the president's house. And it looks like they haven't cut the grass and, you know, uh, trees are not being pruned and bushes are not being pruned. So, I mean, it, it does go into the optics of a part of the power of the presidency. And uh, even though Franklin Roosevelt is the first one to start this, other presidents after him will get much more interested in, in how these outdoor spaces are used and how they're presented. Uh, and this is actually this plan was drawn up uh, by a man named Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, Jr., uh, he was the son of the very famous Frederick Law Olmsted, and he worked with Roosevelt to devise this plan. And if you look at it, it's very similar to the plan that uh, you see still today at the White House. Obviously, uh, there's less trees. Uh, there's a lot of trees drawn in on this, um, and they've they've had to, to hedge it back quite a bit. But uh, this gives you a sense of the use of these spaces even before they became more official uh, with things like the Rose Garden or the Jacqueline Kennedy Garden. Mm -hmm. wow. So if, I'll just jump back. So if you look at this plan, uh, you can see the White, the White House is this darkened box. Uh, it has the two wings on the side of it. To the right, that is the West Wing. Uh, up to that point in time, uh, Roosevelt hadn't expanded it yet, but you can see the Oval Office at the southeast corner where it bumps out a little bit. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, there wasn't an east wing built yet. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt will build it uh, basically where that entranceway is and where that driveway is. He'll build it uh, in 1941, 1942, uh, 
uh, in order to expand office space uh, during World War II. But those two little, you can see there's two little gardens. Uh, it, they basically look like small rectangles with uh, four dots in each one. On the right, that is today's Rose Garden. And on the left, that is today's uh, Jacqueline Kennedy Garden. Oh, cool. On that last photo, so I know every year they do like a Christmas tree at the White House. Is mm -hmm. that somewhere in, on that map? Like where does that happen? <laughs> so uh, when they like when they do the lighting of the national Christmas tree. Yeah. So in recent years, it's been on the ellipse, which is further south of the White House. Okay. So if you were if you were to keep going past this design, uh, it would be on that ellipse space, kind of closer to the National Mall. Uh, but there were times when they did the National Christmas Tree lighting on the South grounds. Uh, in fact, I think you know Franklin Roosevelt uh, is still he's sort of moving around between Lafayette Park, Sherman Square. Uh, and then he also does it on the South grounds at some point as well. Uh, but then it's, you know, it's interesting during World War II, that's when they're doing uh, more conservation policies. So then they, they don't use lights. Uh, and instead, they use brightly colored ornaments. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> so when they start thinking about redesigning the grounds and how do we make these spaces, you know, not only more... Uh, more refined um, for the first family and for their guests. Uh, these spaces are really going to reflect the aesthetics and the tastes of the people who have them redesigned. So this is actually uh, early on in the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Uh, and you'll see there's a lot of parallels here. Uh, usually when you have a first family that oversees a White House renovation or White House refurbishing, um, you know, they, they, they go all in. And uh, the Roosevelt family was one of those families. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had the West Wing built, the original West Wing. And Edith Roosevelt oversaw a lot of the changes within the White House itself, but then also these green spaces. And uh, she specifically wanted uh, what were called colonial gardens, which used much more of these geometric patterns. And, uh, and she had a matching one on the other side, um, which we'll get to in a little bit. But uh, what I want to do is I want to just show you how this space evolved and changed over time. So if you were going to visit the White House today, uh, you would actually enter through the East Wing and then you would walk down this colonnade. Uh, if you walk down the colonnade today, it's actually enclosed. There's glass windows. Uh, but this was the original uh, colonnade after the Roosevelt renovation. And going through those doors would take you then uh, into the ground level of the White House. So when the Wilsons come along, they decide they want to do something a little bit different. Uh, and, and this one is actually uh, redesigned by uh, Ellen Wilson. Uh, and she employs a landscape architect named uh, Beatrix Farron uh, to redesign it. So you can see a, a pretty different, <laughs> pretty different taste. Uh, and this is only about 10 years apart. Of course, I also really like, so they've, they've added the windows to the colonnade. Uh, but then you can also see those window awnings on the White House, uh, which look like they were like pinstriped, maybe. <laughs> uh, it was one of those. I remember uh, later Harry Truman commented about how much he hated them uh, because he thought he thought they were eyesores for the White House. <laughs> they remind me of like a fudge shop or like an old timey like ice cream shop. <laughs> yeah, it's good they're like a, like you're going to a carnival or something. Yeah. Uh, but there was also this little reflection pool you can see in the middle. Uh, so that was something that uh, Ro Edith Roosevelt did not have in the East Garden that Ellen Wilson wanted. Uh, but, you know, during uh, the Truman renovation, speaking of Truman, uh, between 1948 and 1952, that's when he oversaw a major White House renovation. They essentially gutted the building and uh, rebuilt the entire interior with concrete and steel. They dug two sub-basements. And, uh, and now, today, the White House is six stories tall, even though you can only see two stories. Uh, it's because there's a story on the top of the White House, a story on the ground level, and then there's actually two sub-basements that were dug as part of the Truman renovation. So these gardens were pretty much treated as construction zones uh, for that three-and-a-half-year period. Here, of course, they've, they've restored the garden. Uh, it's obviously a lot different than Ellen Wilson's. Uh, and, and this was actually done in time, uh, for a state visit. So that's why you can see it, it's, you know, pretty well manicured and well managed. 
And then finally in the 1960s, that's when the garden gets its latest redesign. It's pretty much stayed fairly consistent to this day. Um, and it was renamed. Uh, the East Garden was renamed in honor of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, while Mrs. Kennedy was invited to attend the ceremony, she actually declined. Uh, as far as we know, the only time that Jacqueline Kennedy came back to the White House was in February 1971 to see her husband and her finished portraits. And uh, the Nixons offered uh, to have her and the, ch the Kennedy children back at the White House to see the portraits. And, uh, and they decided not to do anything public. So they actually... Uh, they, they kept this as quiet as humanly possible. The press never found out. Um, and they were actually able to sneak Mrs. Kennedy and uh, John Jr. and Caroline into the White House. They had dinner with the Nixons. They saw the portraits. Um, and Mrs. Kennedy later said it was one of the happiest days of her life, a day, a day that she long dreaded. Um, but it turned out to be one of the happiest for her and her children. Oh. And, uh, and Mrs. Kennedy, part of the reason it's named after her is because she worked – uh, with uh, the designer who oversaw the redesign of this garden and then also the famous Rose Garden, uh, a woman named Rachel Mellon. Uh, she, she was actually uh, uh, just sort of, uh, she was very interested in design, uh, agriculture, architecture. Uh, she was a friend of the Kennedys, and, uh, and President Kennedy approached her about redesigning the Rose Garden. And then when she did that, she also redesigned this one. Uh, which is why you can see there's a lot of similarities between the two spaces. And this is actually a picture of that ceremony uh, in 1965 when they officially renamed it the Jacqueline Kennedy Garden. Wow, beautiful. Now when we jump over to the other side, this would have been the President's Garden just outside the West Wing. Uh, you can see very different. This was the colonial garden that Edith Roosevelt wanted which would have been very fashionable in the early 1900s. Although it looks a little bit, it looks like it could use some trimming. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> but again, you know, 10 years later, Ellen Wilson wants to redesign the president's garden. Uh, and, and here uh, you can see much higher uh, bushes, shrubs, boxwoods. Uh, but again, this idea of sort of using like a bowling green uh, as a green space for ceremonies or events or photos uh, you can see the, the West Wing looks pretty different. They even have some of those pinstriped uh, window awnings as well. Uh, and then in the background, that's actually the old executive office building. Uh, today, it's the Eisenhower building. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, when his doctor said that he needed to get more fresh air, he actually had a desk set up outside in the garden. And uh, he used it as his outdoor office. He had this tent put up. Um, it, you know, it, it got especially muggy and hot in D.C. in, in, uh, in July and August. So uh, they wanted to get outside where maybe he could catch a few breezes uh, to, to help him uh, and it help improve his health. That might be the ideal situation for all of us right now. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, a, a nice breeze sounds pretty good, doesn't it? No. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, when Rachel Mellon redesigned the president's garden, uh, she wanted to create something that that uh, President Kennedy saw it as this was space to be used by the president, not only for their personal enjoyment, but that this should be a place where you could do things like uh, bill signings, press conferences. I mean, he saw it as this could be like a green theater of sorts. Now, certainly presidents had, had used it here and there uh, for those purposes, but really since Kennedy's time, that's when I think presidents have really seen – uh, a value in using this space. I think part of it is because of its proximity to the Oval Office. Uh, it, it's sort of like the power of the office extends outward. And uh, and also keep in mind, the Oval Office is actually very small. Uh, it, it's not a very big office. In fact, if you, if you think about pictures you've seen of it, you have the Resolute Desk, which is a very large desk. Uh, you usually have a couple of sofas and then there's a couple of chairs, um, you know, scattered throughout the room. I mean, really, you, you can't fit a lot of people in that space. So if you're going to do something more publicly and you want to have it in, within proximity to the Oval Office, the Rose Garden is the ideal place to do it. And, of course, here's a – so uh, this is them planting one of these uh, saucer magnolia trees. Uh, they put four of them, one in each corner, 
uh, and they actually took these trees from the tidal basin uh, and put them in at the White House. And here you can see the finished product of those uh, of those trees in the corners. And then, of course, we have the stairs going up. The other thing that Kennedy uh, said that he wanted was that um, you know there had been, there were stairs before that just sort of went straight up. You know, they were just one, two, three, four, five, six stairs. Uh, what he wanted was a, a platform. So a couple stairs, then a platform, and then a few more stairs. And he wanted it because he thought that elevated position would be great for things like speeches, press conferences, uh, ceremonies. And, uh, and that was what was, to, that is President Kennedy's wish was to have the stairs designed that way. Okay. That looks beautiful in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to include, this is just a great, uh, a great image. Uh, so there, there's been uh, many weddings at the White House, uh, but probably one of the most famous ones uh, was uh, the wedding between uh, Edward Cox and uh, Trisha Nixon. And uh, this was, this actually took place in the Rose Garden. And, uh, and you can see President Nixon and First Lady Pat Nixon very happy uh, with, with how things are, I guess, everything's going very smoothly. He seems very pleased. Yeah. Uh, or maybe he's very happy in the, in the match. Uh, <laughs> but, but either way, it was, it was a major, uh, it was a major event uh, for media and, uh, and, and really for, you know, the United States, people were watching using this president's garden uh, to see one of the presidential daughters get married. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final place I just wanted to show you on our walking tour is one that's secluded. It's a little bit further on the south grounds, and this is called the Children's Garden. And it, it was thought of and created by uh, Lady Bird Johnson, and uh, it was dedicated just before they left office in 1969. And the idea was to have a, a secluded, quiet place for presidential grandchildren uh, to play in. And then the idea came up with why not put their handprints and their footprints uh, into the stone? And you can see some of the handprints and footprints there. And, you know, I, I think part of the reason they do that, and it's, it's become true ever since the Johnsons were there, is that more and more uh, presidential grandchildren tend to spend time at the White House uh, because usually presidents and first ladies are older and their children are adults and, uh, you know, they don't live at the White House with their parents. Um, you know, there are some exceptions. Chelsea Clinton was younger. Uh, Sasha and Malia and uh, Obama were younger. Uh, Barron Trump, uh, younger. Uh, so, you know, there, there are some exceptions to that. But, you know, since the Johnson's time, most of the children that were in the White House were grandchildren. And Lady Bird Johnson wanted a special place for them to be able to sneak off. Uh, there's a little pond uh, with fish. Uh, they have small, you can see there's a small uh, piece of furniture there. So they have some small furniture for the children to play in as well. And uh, presidential grandchildren have, have put their handprints and their footprints uh, in, into some of these flagstones uh, scattered throughout uh, the children's garden. Very cute. I love that idea. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed our walking tour of the White House. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a place where I think uh, there's this assumption or this conceptualization that, you know, the White House is the way it is because it's always been that way. When in fact, uh, you know, it's actually a place of, of constant change and evolution. And, uh, and I think, you know, when you, walk through the physical spaces and you see the trees, the gardens, um, you know, even things like the fences and the, the walls. I mean, these things evolve and change over time, depending on who's living at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And uh, I know that I, I'm sure everybody wishes that they could go on one of these spring tours and they could see the white house and, and, and go out and, and actually uh, you know, maybe even smell the pollen, smell the flowers in the air. But, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to tag along with me to walk through White House history. And uh, thank you so much, Dream Wakers, for having me. Thank you. That was amazing. I feel like I learned so much. I didn't. I had no idea about a lot of these things. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to share and put together this presentation for us. If there are viewers who want to learn more, I know White House Historical does a lot of really great things. Can you point them in the direction of where they could learn more? 
Sure, you can go to our website, www.whitehousehistory.org. And uh, even within the page, you know, we have curriculum resource packets for teachers. If you're interested in, in specific subjects uh, like the history of the grounds or art in the White House or presidents and, and first ladies, uh, we have 30 CRPs already designed for teachers to use uh, in classrooms. Uh, we also have many uh, online resources, uh, original articles, and, uh, and in fact, I would highly recommend we have an article on our website by one of our authors, Jonathan Pliska, who wrote an entire book about the history of the grounds and the gardens. Uh, so I would highly suggest reading that if you want to learn more uh, about uh, the history behind the grounds and, and what all went into, into making them uh, the White House grounds as we know today. Amazing. Great. Those are fantastic resources. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you again for just taking the time to be here today. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us on today's Dream Wakers Daily. We really appreciate you being here and hope that we get to see you again next time.